Buongiorno. Good morning. Welcome back to our Rome book club titled Primo Levi, The Truth, A Guide to Returning to Life. For those of you joining us for the first time today, my name is Silvia Dallolio and I serve as the director of the University of Notre Dame Rome Global Gateway. It is a pleasure to be accompanied in this journey through Primo Levi's book and life by Professor Barry McCray, Professor of English, Keough Family Professor of Irish Studies, and concurrent professor of romance and Irish languages and literatures. Barry's suggestion to focus this book club on Italian writer and chemist Primo Levi was a great one for a number of reasons. So thanks again, Barry, for that. Including the fact that our Rome Gateway has an ongoing initiative that focuses on promoting the preservation of Jewish heritage in the city and is done in collaboration with the historical archive of the Jewish community of Rome, one of the oldest Jewish communities around the world. As some of you may know, our current student residence villa in the Chilean neighborhood was used as a school for Jewish children from 1938 to 1940, when they were expelled from Italian public schools after the racial laws were instituted. This connection alimented the intellectual and scholarly interest in Jewish studies and literature in Rome. And this book club is a perfect expression of that. But the connections between Notre Dame and Primo Levi are also present and important on campus, where Hesburgh Libraries house the Primo Levi collection that includes all first editions of, first, of uh, Levi's works published within his lifetime, as well as first editions of notable translations of Levi's writings that document its importance outside of Italy. Also present are first editions of Levi's own efforts as translator of both literary and literary works. Going back to the work of Lady that is the focus of this book club, as we've seen last time, The Truth is a book written more than 15 years after World War II, where Levy tells the story of his journey back from Auschwitz after the liberation. In our first meeting last week, Professor McCrea walked us through the first five chapters of The Truth. But before we right, jump right into that conversation, I'd like to take a few moments to provide some logistical information. Questions for our faculty are more than welcome at any time. To submit them, please use the Google form that we're sharing with you now. We'll try to respond to as many questions as possible, but if we don't get to all of them, we do have a private moderated discussion board on LinkedIn to continue the discussion. This program is made possible by a number of people, including Costanza Montanari and Danilo Domenici here in Rome and campus staff, as well as co-sponsors for this series, the University of Notre Dame Tylemore Abbey Center and the Alumni Association. This week, we're going to set aside the five, final 15 minutes of our live conversation for a breakout session so that you can meet each other and discuss today's topic in small groups. We will hold these breakouts at the end of the program. Should you not wish to break out, you may choose to leave the meeting as we will now be reconvening after the community circle breakout. As always, a few pre-recorded videos, audio, audio listenings and articles are posted on the Think and D website where Professor McCray introduces some aspects of the meeting. And now Barry, please take it from here. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much, um, Silvia, and uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, last week, um, in looking at the beginning of this book and its origins, I talked a lot about Primo Levi's identity as a scientist. And today, in looking at the middle of the book, I'd like to look at the other side of his uh, talent, that of a novelist, that his talent, his extraordinary talent as a novelist. And in doing this, it's a way to look at some of the things that are mysterious about this book, because it's a book that seems simple on the surface, but which I think you'll all find as you read it, has things that are strange and unexpected about it. Most of all, this book excites in us um, emotions different from the ones we would expect in a book about the aftermath of the Holocaust. It's a much more carefully constructed work of art than appears on the surface. So it has a, I said this last week too, it has a simplicity of form that is actually deceptive. It's a fictionalized and much more carefully and artfully put together a document than it appears. It's a novel, not a documentary. And Primo Levi wrote this in a moment of his life when he was becoming a novelist 
And he was thinking about and realizing the things that novels can do that history or documentary or memoir or science cannot do. Novels know certain things and can tell us certain things that no other form can do. So I want to think about what are the aspects of this work as a novel? What special kinds of knowledge can it give us as a novel? So I suppose the first thing um, that strikes me is how different the emotional landscape of this book is from its physical landscape. It takes place in a physical landscape that is ravaged by war and poverty, by violence and hunger. It's a, a world that is characterized especially by scarcity. However, its emotional landscape, the landscape that we encounter with our emotions as we read it, is one that is rich and plentiful and abundant. What is the overriding emotion of this book? You might talk about this in the breakout rooms um, at the end. Certainly, there's a mixture of emotions, and people who read this book often find themselves laughing and crying simultaneously from the same passage. It gives us a sense of abundance in emotion. The uh, sheer variety of emotional responses it generates in, uh, in, in us gives us a sense of an abundant world, not a scarce one. And this is the first thing that a novel can do in restoring balance, to produce forms of abundance within situations of scarcity. And I hope that this can be helpful for us in the, the, the scarcities that we face now in the aftermath of, or wherever we are in the process of the global pandemic. Because this book, in many ways, is a guide to where abundance is hidden. Even in physical shortages, we have a feeling of plenty in this book, of types of people, of interactions, of possibilities. Everyone has something to sell. Everyone has something to say. So this is connected to the fact that this novel is telling the story of a movement from order to disorder, the extreme order of the concentration camps to the extreme disorder and chaos of Europe in the aftermath of the war. We have a babel of different languages. We have confusions of roles, confusion of authority, confusions of people, directions, ideas. And this is the opposite to the regime of the Nazi camps, which work on the principle of, of strict classification and order. After the gray ordered emptiness of the camps and the sameness, the homogeneity of the camps, we have a world that feels varied and full. The overriding emotions of this book, I think, are not sadness or bitterness, but they're also not fun or pleasure. It strikes me that the overriding emotions of this book are two, hunger and joy. And these two things, hunger and joy, are connected by what we might call appetite. That's what connects hunger and joy. And if you think back on the reading we had for this week, um, you'll remember that there were many striking scenes of voracious appetite for food. There's a moment when a levy is embarrassed to go and ask for a fourth helping of soup. There's a lot of descriptions of the food, how it's prepared, how it's distributed. And there's lots of scenes of voracious appetite, but it also mentions that this hunger in the characters in the book is matched by what Levy calls a psychological hunger, an appetite for life, and especially an appetite for exchange and company with other human beings. Now, what differentiates joy from other positive emotions like fun or pleasure is that joy is something that erupts spontaneously. It emerges out of nothing. It takes you by surprise. And this is a central interest of the book. What springs out of nothing? How things spring out of nothing? How life and vitality occur naturally? If you read this book carefully, you'll notice that the joy that is present there is not something usually that is experienced in the moment. There are some joyful moments, such as the moment when the Russian soldiers all put on a play. But it's rarely joy experienced in the moment. Rather, the joy from this book comes from the way in which the experiences are narrated to the reader. Joy comes from telling, not just the act of telling, that's partly that, but the way of telling. Levy manages, even in this situation of what we might call post-trauma, 
manages to give something to the reader. This book is an act of giving in many ways. In other words, it's a form of exchange. And this is the key word, I think, for the chapters we read today. And it's the key word for what I want to say uh, to you this evening. Well, it's evening here in Rome, in the, the daytime over in, in the States. But exchange is the key word I want us to think about today. Exchange in various forms in this novel turns out to be the key to recovery. The first form of exchange is narration, telling one story and listening to other people's stories. And in the aftermath of Auschwitz, there's quite a story to tell. But, and this is one of the strange things about this book, the horror of Auschwitz is never directly or very rarely directly evoked. And in fact, anytime Levy tries to tell people directly about the camps, it doesn't work. Something about trying to tell the story directly, give the facts straight to people about Auschwitz doesn't work. In fact, the very things we would, we would expect to be evoked or narrated directly are not. The camps obviously is the first one. Auschwitz is never narrated directly here. And also, as I mentioned last week, lost families waiting at home, the relatives that the, uh, the prisoners hope to rejoin once they get home. But these things are present in this book in indirect ways. They leave their traces throughout the, the novel in other ways. Often they come up in parodic versions, in caricature uh, forms. For example, the word maternal comes up in strange moments in the, in the text. You might have noticed it. There's a moment where the soldiers in the barracks prepare straw beds for Levy and his Greek friend with what he calls maternal care. Or when Cesare is uh, trying to sell something to somebody, he puts his, his hand on the shoulder of his potential client um, with a, in a maternal gesture. So we have this word maternal just lingering in the back uh, a few times. The Russian soldiers in the barracks are described as a temporary family. We get things like that um, a number of times. But also, I mean, this for me is one of the most concrete examples of it. We have pantomime versions of horrific facts that we've already been given. So for example, the character Cesare, we know that Levy meets him in the camp when Cesare is sick with dysentery. He's almost dying of, of dysentery. We just get that in a very short uh, aside in the novel. What we do get in great detail is a very funny pantomime where Cesare, later, much later on, fakes a form of sickness that's quite like dysentery by um, eating rotten cigars. So we have a pantomime version, a fun, joyful pantomime version of a horrific fact that happened earlier on. And that happens in a, lots of different ways. We have the figure of Rovi, the Italian who puts himself in charge of the camps and wears kind of ridiculous um, homemade uniform. And we have the Russians and soldiers in the play. But all throughout the novel, the importance of farce Pantomime and parody is emphasized as a way of restoration, restoring oneself to life. Farce, pantomime, parody, caricature, they turn out to be an indirect way of narr narrating traumatic things, a way of narrating them in joyful skies. This is because narration is a form of exchange to tell a story, to take on board other stories. This is something that is urgently needed after experiencing a disaster, to tell one's story, to hear the stories of others. But this novel suggests that it can't be done directly, or at least it's more powerful and more therapeutic, if you like, if done indirectly, if arranged in a way that produces joy. For the teller, it's a way of processing his or her experience bit by bit, rather than, than in one go. We have several scenes of narration in the novel and all of them are parodic in some form. The only one I'll, I'll remind you of now is when Levy meets a priest in the, in the streets in Poland and um, finds that the only language they have in common is Latin. And Levy tries to tell him about Auschwitz using his schoolboy Latin. And he says it gave it, what he was narrating a taste of the blue perfect. In other words, it put a distance between him and what he was telling. And this distance is crucial for returning to life in the novel. So I'd like to look a little bit at the two characters in particular that Levy meets 
uh, with whom he has meaningful exchanges. There are characters that you certainly will stand out in your memory of this novel. The first one is the Greek, the super Greek, Mordo Nahum. This is how he's introduced um, in the novel. Levy says, I can't recall exactly how and when my Greek emerged out of the nothingness. This is a great example of how what looks like an ordinary throwaway statement is actually doing a lot of hidden work for Levy in the book. My Greek emerged out of the nothingness. And this word nothingness, vuoto or nulla in Italian, Levy associates all throughout this novel with the Nazis and with the camps. So this arrival out of nothingness and emerging out of, not, out of nothingness contains in a nutshell, the spontaneous regrowth of life, which this novel is so interested in. It's not order, which we had in the camp, but disorder. The opposite of the evil of the camps is not what is morally good, but what is natural and spontaneous, what emerges uncontrolled in a disordered way out of nothing. So this Greek, uh, Mordoneum, was one of the Greeks of Salonika. Salonika was a majority Jewish city um, before the, the war, or at least a very substantial Jewish city before the war. 90% of the Jews of Salonika were murdered. They had come originally from Spain, so they spoke Ladino, a Jewish version of Spanish. And Mordoneum represents this community. That's one of his jobs in the, in, in the novel, if you like. He is not at all a morally pure person. We'll see later on in the novel um, that he's very far from being a morally pure person. But he does represent the opposite of the camps in his vitality and his narration. So what about his narration? What does he narrate to Levy or to us? There's one sentence that always stands out to me in my memory when I think about the relationship between Levy and his Greek friend. Levy says, of his two years in Auschwitz, he never spoke to me. So in all the time that they're friends, both survivors of the camps, he never spoke of his two years in Auschwitz. So what did he speak of to Levy? Here we get what is for me one of the most beautiful and moving passages in the book. I'll, I'll read out to you now. He talked to me instead, of Auschwitz that is, about his many activities in Salonika, of the batches of goods bought, sold, smuggled by sea or at night across the Bulgarian border, of the scams shamefully endured and those gloriously perpetrated. And finally, of the happy tranquil hours passed on the shore of the Gulf after the day of work with his merchant colleagues in certain cafes on stilts that he described with unusual abandon and of the long conversations that were held there. What conversations? About money, about customs, about freight charges, naturally, but also about other things. What is to be understood by knowledge, by spirit, by justice, by truth? What is the nature of the fragile tie that binds the soul to the body? How it is established at birth and released at death? What is freedom and how to reconcile the conflict between freedom of the spirit and faith? What follows death too and other great Greek things? So here we have in a nutshell, what Levy presents as the opposite to the camps. He says, of his two years in Auschwitz, um, he never spoke to me. And we have, the, our first thought is, what else do they have to speak of other than Auschwitz? Well, it turns out a whole lot, an enormous profusion of great Greek things. Levy goes on to say, why the Greek told me these things, why he confessed to me isn't clear. Maybe in front of me, who was so different, so foreign, he felt alone and his conversation was a monologue. This is one of the saddest lines for me uh, in this book. Um, and this is the fear. So far, and he felt alone and his conversation was a monologue. This is the fear that is a, a fear that is threaded throughout the book, a fear that there will not be exchange, that no one will listen, there'll be nobody to tell your story to. But in fact, we know that here the fear was misplaced. Levy has written it down, what the Greek said has been recorded. He was not alone. Nonetheless, in the evocation of this fear, the fear that in some way he was alone, just monologuing, we have indirectly the specter of the camps 
where no one listens, where everyone was alone. Now, the character of the Greek was supposedly mostly drawn from real life. But the other character who stands out, Cesare, is a fictional composite. He's a, a, a mosaic, Levy said, of lots of different people. He is, whereas Nahum, Mordo Nahum represented the Jews of Greece, of Salonika. Cesare represents the Jews of Rome. And Sylvia mentioned uh, earlier on that the, the, the uh, Rome Global Gateway has, has a real connection to this lost, or partly lost community. 2,000 of the Roman Jews were deported and only 102 of them survived. And of the more than 1,000 of them who were sent to Auschwitz, only 15 came back. Uh, but there were some aspects about the Jews of Rome that were unusual too. Um, only a quarter of them were deported, which is less than in other parts of Italy. And in Rome, the Italian police, unlike in other parts of Italy, didn't collaborate in, in, in the arrest. So the chief model for Cesare was a real person that Levi met in the camps. Uh, his name was Lello Perugia. And the origins of the friendship, as described in the book, are apparently accurate, that Levi heard through the wall in the infirmary somebody speaking Italian. He went in to check on him, found that he was dying of dysentery. He brought him water and soup and helped him um, come back to life, and they remained friends. Levi also says that the personality of Cesare, as it's described in the book, was also drawn from real life. His ability to adapt to circumstances, his capacity to charm everybody, his ability to find ingenious stratagems, and so on. But in fact, this person, Lello Perugia, who's one of the models of Cesare, was not from the ghetto in Rome, and he was not a stallholder in the market of Porta Portese, like Cesare is in the book. In fact, he was an accountant and he was very politically engaged. But he was very Roman. His family was the uh, eighth generation uh, Roman. Why this transformation? Why in the fictional version of Cesare did Levi make him a working class merchant, stallholder? Partly because, to, he, because he was exa deliberately exaggerating and emphasizing certain aspects of his character that were, also, that were typical of working class Roman Jews of the ghetto. And in doing so, by kind of turning up the volume, if you like, in those aspects of his personality and making him seem um, more part of that working class Jewish Rome than he was, Levy is memorializing and recording a population and a culture that was, to all intents and purposes, wiped out by the Holocaust. So both Mordonaeum and Cesare have that role in the novel of recording and memor me uh, memorializing. They too are an indirect way of narrating something, in this case, the Jewish cultures of Salonika and Rome uh, that uh, were destroyed by the Holocaust. The Greek may have emerged from nothing, but because Levi is recording him, it will not be allowed and his culture will not be allowed to disappear into nothing. But as well as their Jewishness, Levy emphasizes their Greekness and their Romanness. And this is a subtle and indirect way of recording the fact that European Jews were not just adjacent, were not adjacent to European culture, but they rather, rather they incarnated it. Just as Mordoneum is a super Greek, Cesare is a super Roman, if you like. He incarnates the city of Rome, the character of the people of Rome. And it's no accident, I think, that these two places, Greek and Rome, are the two great classical cultures of pre-Christian Europe. So Levy is also indirectly laying, uh, if you like, a universal claim uh, to Jewishness. Finally, and this for me is the most interesting aspect of, uh, of these characters and of the middle of this book, what they, what they have in common is an ability to trade, to sell, to bargain, to make deals. And we get to know these characters largely through scenes of trade or negotiation. Both of them are extremely able merchants. At times, both of them are, to some extent, swindlers. In fact, one of the chief preoccupations of this book is trade and commerce. And the, the process of negotiating, of trading, bargaining, trying to get a good deal, worrying you won't get a good deal, not getting a good deal, that process is something which is lovingly 
and in great detail analyzed and described in this book. Everyone in this book seems to have something to sell. A chicken, a ride on a cart, a shirt with a hole in it, a ring, an Italian German dictionary, a ballpoint pen that doesn't write, eggs both raw and hard boiled. Why is there such an emphasis on buying and selling, and especially on negotiating? Why does Levy seem to derive such joy from it? And in fact, how does he make us feel such joy in, in this? It's, after all, it's just commerce. But in this book, it's, there's something almost magical about the joy it produces. There are three reasons for it, I think. The first is that trading is something that emerges like the Greek from nothing. It's something that occurs everywhere. Even in the middle of Auschwitz, there was a little market. So trading, negotiating, exchange is a miracle of human resourcefulness, something that just sprouts up naturally wherever you put more than one human being in a situation. Second of all, it's because, and this is, as I said, the key word for today, it's a form of exchange. To barter with somebody, to, fig to try and get a deal with somebody brings up the same questions as narrating, as telling or listening to a story. The question being, what is in the other's mind? How much does he want what I'm selling? How much will he accept to sell it to me? What's in his pocket? What's under his hand? So the same questions we have in narrating, what is in the mind of the other is what we have in bartering exchange. Finally, Trade and commerce and negotiating represent the opposite of fascism and Nazism. The Nazi ideology was to conserve purity, to eliminate interactions between different peoples. In the world that Levy depicts for us here, trade represents the opposite of that. It brings people into contact with each other. Haggling forces them to inhabit each other's mental space. So it's exchange in both a concrete sense and a much deeper one. The opposite of the brutalizing system of the camp, the novel suggests, is to go out and engage with others, people different from oneself, in a spirit of inquiry and curiosity, to learn fragments of their language and especially learn fragments of their inner life. What's relevant for us, perhaps, is the fact that the emotional experience of an event, and this is this, I'm, I'm saying something here about not just about trade and commerce, but about the, the book as a whole, the world, the emotional world of the book as a whole. What's relevant, I think, for us is that the emotional experience of an event does not follow the same chronology as the historical experience. It takes a long time for our minds to catch up with the facts on the ground. So you can say, the camps are over, Auschwitz is closed, the war is finished, you're going home. But your mind is not in an emotional sense, your mind takes a long time to catch up with that fact. And it's not an easy journey for the mind or the emotions to arrive there. And this is the other odyssey that, that the novel recounts. We have the physical odyssey of going from Poland back to Italy. We also have a mental odyssey where the mind has to make its way out of Auschwitz. And it happens much later than the body. Our minds, our feelings, our inner selves have their own timing. We can remain emotionally inside an experience, such as pandemic lockdown, long after, it's, long after it is over. And we can only recover it bit by bit. And usually um, the best way is by indirect means. Okay, thank you. That's all I have to say um, for today. So I'll have a look and um, see what questions are coming in. So there's a question from John Gregory. He says, how should Primo Levi's apparent suicide factor into our understanding of the truce? Do you think that it's even relevant? If not, why not? If so, then what does the suicide mean in terms of, of the hopefulness of the novel, its love of the abundance of life. It's a very complicated question and lots of people ask this um, about Levy. It's, there is some 
there is some lingering doubt um, about whether or not he committed he committed suicide. And it's not he he certainly fell from the third floor of uh, his apartment building. Um, and maybe it was suicide, it may well have been. There's a few different things there. One is suicide is um, a very complex thing and we never know what leads somebody to take their own life. It's uh, one of the things we could even learn from this novel in fact is that the inner life of others is something very complex and uh, difficult to reach. So I think we wouldn't want to um, it would be wrong to assume we can know what went on um, in, in, in Levy's mind or the mind of anybody who finds himself in that desperation. The other thing is what I said earlier, which is um, that the, the, um, the, 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 the psychic timing, we might call it, is very different from physical or historical timing. And we don't know ever how and when the mind is going to respond to experiences that it's had. Uh, it's something that is unpredictable and everybody has their own timing. It's different from everybody else's, but not usually on the same page. The other part of what I would, um, the final way I would answer this uh, question, uh, John, is that this, is an, this novel is about really fleeting moments. It's an attempt to capture fleeting, passing feelings that don't last. So this book isn't one that is about the future. It's a one that is really about the capturing the present, capturing all of the richness and possibilities that there are in any present moment, leaving the question of the future to another moment. It's not a book that tries to, to control or plan for the future. So um, while waiting for a few more questions to come in, um, I might just say a little bit um, more about this. Um, I said a, something about it in the recorded lecture uh, for today, um, but this is the question of fleeting in, encounters, that the, the impulse to bear witness to a traumatic experience, that is what is behind this novel, obviously to a great degree, the desire to record what happened, but Levy turns that impulse to bear witness into something more joyful and expansive. And, and so the, the, the passage I'd like to read out, I, this is, as, as I said, this was in the recorded lecture, but just many of you might not have uh, seen that. Um, in this passage, Levy is narrating the end of another fleeting encounter. With this, it's, and this time it's with a young Ukrainian woman called Galina. And he says, in the middle of May, a few days after the end of the war, Galina came to say goodbye to me. She was leaving. They told her she could go home. Did she have a travel order? Did she have money for the train? No, she answered. There's no need. These things always arrange themselves. And she disappeared, sucked up by the emptiness of the Russian space into the pathways of her boundless country, leaving behind a bitter scent of earth, of youth, of joy. I think that the inner logic of this book can be summed up by that scent that she leaves behind. It's a logic that is informed in every way by the experience of disaster and especially of survival. But the, its goal is to center our attention for a moment on passing connections and ephemeral experiences. Those ones that every life has, but which usually are forgotten or erased from memory. So there's a, another question from Helen Weick. Again, it's about Levy's um, possible suicide. And she says, is it possible that if Levy did commit suicide, it was related to the rise of anti-Semitism again in Europe, or more to the realization that the old Jew Jewish communities were actually ir irreversibly gone? I, I don't know. Um, again, we don't know what goes on in the mind of anybody. Um, It happened a long time um, after the war. So whatever it was, um, whatever he was feeling then, whether or not it led him to suicide, um, was a long way removed. 
uh, from what happened in the in, in, in the 1940s. Um, but he was he did go back and visit Auschwitz. There's a there's a, an interesting documentary about that that you can watch an Italian documentary where he goes back and confronts it. Uh, my feeling is that um, all of these things are um, very complex and their timing is very unpredictable. Uh, so in, in truth, we just can't know. So um, my colleague Costanza has a question. Um, can you say something more about the connection between hunger and joy in terms of appetite? Does this relate to the ephemeral? Yes, that's, um, it really does relate to the ephemeral. And we have, um, Hunger is something that in a very basic way is throughout this uh, novel, it's obsessed with food. Uh, it keeps talking about it. But you know, hunger is a need that is a, a very basic physical need that is satisfied. Whereas appetite is something different because it, appetite is an anticipation, if you like, of joy. And the physical hunger, this is one of the miraculous transformations of, the, of this novel. The physical hunger that comes from, de from deprivation is transformed by this novel into an appetite for life. And it's related to the ephemeral, to things that are fleeting and passing. Be because of the, uh, it, appetite here becomes a form of curiosity for the other. And a form of curiosity about what the world is going to throw at you next. Who's going to arrive into the barracks or um, the train compartment or who you're going to meet around the corner of the road. And I find this one of the most moving and extraordinary transformations and um, that Levy's able to, to do here, to turn physical hunger, the idea of physical hunger, which is one of the great traumas of the camps, all the survivors talk about it, and that their relationship to food is never the same afterwards. Levy's able to turn that, that traumatic dynamic of needing nourishment, lacking nourishment, and into an expectation of abundance, um, including psychological abundance, human, kind of human abundance. So in five minutes, I'm going to send you into um, um, in the breakout rooms. Oh, there's another question from Fritz. So Fritz says, um, in my opinion, the Gottlieb character is very intriguing and one of the most significant in the novel. Did he use the doctor's real name or did he choose it for the meanings of the name? It has both a significance in German and in the Ashkenazic Jewish community. So, so I don't know um, whether it was his real name or not. Um, Gottlieb, he means you know, um, love of God. Uh, um, but I would like to say something about both Gottlieb and um, Signor uh, Unverdorben, the, the man from, from Trieste. Um, one of, the, one of the, the miraculous transformations, um, and kind of funny ones that come up in, in this novel, is the way in which everybody seems to be endowed with magic powers. After the extreme deprivation of the camp of the camps and ordinary things ordinary expedients and freedoms take on a kind of magical quality and people like Gottlieb and um, Signor Unferdorben and indeed the Greek um, and Cesare um, they're very ordinary human talents in the world of this novel come to seem like uh, magical powers so question for Imer O'Dwyer so Emer says, you've emphasized the central importance of commerce, barter, and other forms of exchange as a means for affirming life and value in the reawakening. What can be said about culture and friendship as Levy represents them? I'm thinking of the moment when Cesare becomes disillusioned, as Levy writes, with friendship, culture, indeed with the printed paper itself, when he, Levy, insists that the dictionary does not have the words for courtship that Cesare desires. Well, one of the things that um, Levy loves about Cesare is, um, and about the Greek too, is their attachment to action. Um, their interest, they're, they're people who are driven by 
um, concrete actions. And in fact, the Greek at one point says to Levi, oh, anybody can talk. Words, words, words. Words are useless. That's when he's trying to, Levi's trying to talk his way into the barracks. And the Greek knows already that there's no point in talking, that what you need is something concrete. And while Levi, it's one of the very funny scenes, while Levi is talking, 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 the Greek is already rummaging in the backpack to find the food that he's going to offer them um, to get in. But Levi himself is not dis disillusioned um, at all with printed paper or with culture. And one of the ways in which he affects the transformations I've talked about is by connecting them in his mind, connecting what happens uh, in front of him to um, cultural uh, parallels. And, and one of the funny things is that he does is he compares very ordinary things to big um, classical or kind of cultural uh, references. And in fact, Mordonahem, one part of his Greekness is that he recalls uh, heroes of Greek uh, epics and also um, in some ways, Greek philosophy, Stoic philosophy. And so I don't think that, that Levy has that disillusionment. On the contrary, I think the world of culture and printed paper was uh, for him a source of real salvation. So another question, um, you talk about encounters with others, but most of his encounters are with people who are less than honest. The merchants cheating people and the fellow who took the letter to his family trying to cheat them. Is there something significant there? Absolutely, there is. And one of the meanings of the title, I'm convinced, the truce, which is the, the more accurate English translation of the Italian title. One of the meanings of that is a suspension of moral judgment. That um, blaming and judging is not going to restore life. They are not life enhancing things to do. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't be done at, at some point. It's not that the Nazis get let, let off the hook. But in attempting to return to life, to a sense of plenitude, moral, moral condemnation is not helpful. And as I said earlier on, the opposite for Levy of the emptiness uh, and the nothingness of Nazi ideology of the camps is not moral goodness or moral purity, but vitality and exchange. And even cheating people is a form of exchange. Whereas the, the logic of the camps um, is a different one. So the other, the, the victim has, is not given any interior, if you like, is not given, um, is not allowed even the dignity of being cheated, uh, if you like. That there's no sense that at, cheating at least, it's not that the book is in favor of cheating, and Levy himself is, is obviously very honest. Um, but that this kind of, this form of swindling is also a form of exchange, a way of putting yourself in another person's shoes. So here's another um, question from a colleague. Uh, Sylvia says, um, memory and the ephemeral. Is this a paradox that we can take as one possible synthesis of the novel? Oh, that's a beautiful, that's a great, uh, that's, a, that's a lovely formulation. That, that it is true, memory and the ephemeral, fleeting experiences um, and memory are things that work against each other usually. And in fact, in this novel, they are also pulling in two different directions. But what the novel does try to do is, is synthesize them. And that, that comes up actually in the, in the passages I read about the Greek, um, when he's talking about what the, what the Greeks talk about, um, that is one of the things that what, what happened, what, what kind of afterlife there is, what is the relationship between the soul and the body? I think, yeah, that's, that's beautifully put. Um, but I see if I'm right, it's time for um, breakout rooms. So, um, so this is, Going to happen automatically, right? Or do, I, or do I do it? It is going to happen automatically. We're going to go now into breakout rooms for 15 minutes. Please feel free to leave if you don't wish to join them, and we'll, we'll see uh, each other again in two weeks. We're going to skip next Friday as it's Black Friday, uh, but the December uh, on December 3rd we'll be we'll be back here at the same time. Um, we wish for all of you, of course, to join the breaker rooms that are going to go uh, into which we're going to go.